name's John Browning. I'm the Managing Director of Bands Financial. And we've prepared three videos to cover the most important areas of trading into China. And essentially, at the beginning, I want to ask you four questions. They are, do you currently trade crude oil, fuel oil, copper, rubber, iron ore, and any of the major exchanges like the CME, COMEX, ICE, or SGX? Do you agree that the price of these commodities is increasingly driven by the price action in China? Do you see that the liquidity of these markets as a potential advantage for your investment strategy? Could you access those markets? And if you could access those markets, do you expect significant arbitrage opportunities between the Chinese domestic commodity markets and their international counterparts? Now, if you answered yes to any of those questions, then this short series of videos are designed to enable a qualified professional investor to understand the options and the pitfalls of trading directly into China using a Western located broker and the overseas intermediary mechanism. The videos are in three parts. China's futures markets, the available routes to trade into the Chinese futures markets, and the issues arising from trading in China. Each video should take about 15, maybe 20 minutes. And in total, I cannot make you an expert, but I can give you a very good basis on how to trade in China. So let's put it all in context. After joining the WTO in 2001, China is gradually opening its financial markets to foreign investors. Market reform is a key pillar of Chinese policy and a major focus is on the fixed income, securities and commodity futures markets. This year's inclusion of China into major bond and equity markets has opened the door for foreign investors to participate in China's 17 trillion bond market. The growth of these markets has become uh, extremely important globally. China is the second largest bond uh, market and its cash equities market is growing uh, exponentially. According to the China Futures Association, uh, China is the largest commodity futures market uh, in the world with 5.4 billion lots traded uh, this year, uh, January through to November in 2020. That's up 50% since 2019. The total share of, of uh, commodity futures in China is currently 50%. That is, one in every two lots of commodity futures is currently traded in China. So this first video is really the background uh, to, the, uh, to the second two. So we just need to lay out some, some definitions. Now, first of all, China has six futures exchanges, all government owned. Probably the most famous is the Shanghai Futures Exchange, the SHFE. It trades copper, aluminium, zinc, uh, natural rubber, fuel oil, and gold. The second exchange in, in, here in Shanghai is the uh, CIFEX. It is the, um, it's, it's where stock indices uh, trade and the two five-year and 10-year treasury, uh, treasury future uh, trade. The Shanghai Energy Exchange, the INE, trades crude oil, fuel oil, rubber, and recently copper. Um, and that one is open for access by international investors. The Shenzhou Commodity Exchange in the middle of the country trades wheat, sugar, cotton, rapeseed, and PTA. And Dalian, uh, the commodity exchange in the north of the country, trades corn, soybean, soybean meal, soybean oil, and most importantly, iron ore. Soon to be launched in Guangzhou, uh, adjacent to uh, Hong Kong, in the Greater Bay area, is the uh, carbon 
and uh, emissions exchange, but that hasn't opened yet. China is opening up its futures markets for imported commodities. Crude oil opened in March 2018, uh, iron ore opened in May 20, 2018. They've been open for the last two years. However, they probably haven't had as much exposure internationally as, uh, as we've seen uh, recently. And that's maybe a function of the fact that um, it was difficult for international houses to reach those exchanges uh, using um, the trading platforms available. However, that has now changed, which is an item that we're going to come on to very strongly in the, uh, in the second video. So, why are the exchanges opening now? Why are these contracts opening now? Commodity prices are based on location, quality and delivery date. That would mean that the prices inside China would have a different dynamic to international prices. But the international, these markets should uh, be adjacent to one another. Otherwise, if you're in China, you may be overpaying for your copper or you may be selling copper too cheaply. What we need to do is to bring these markets um, so that they are adjacent to each other. The prices are adjacent. The price in China is adjacent to the international, the international price. Now, this has been the focus of, uh, of, of the, the markets or the intermediary mechanism now for about two years. And it's increasingly being adopted uh, among many international investors. But should, uh, we, we need to look forward here, should these, these routes open up, then it's likely that China will be the price maker within the region and not a price taker. Prices in the Asian region would reflect the demand and supply situation in the region and China uh, in particular. Why is China so dominant? Why, why is it doing so many uh, uh, commodity futures contracts? Well, the answer to that lies in China's consumption, uh, its appetite for these, uh, for these markets. Now, in 2019, China consumed 51% of all global copper. In the most recent uh, data I have in, in August, China's ref refined copper imports hit 554,000 tonnes. That's an 89% increase year on year and a 14% increase in August alone. Now, this is 2020, the, the, the date now today is December 2020, we're you know, a few days away from Christmas. But those figures would, would confirm that China's uh, market is recovering and uh, that um, the import of, of, uh, of copper, which to, in many ways is a proxy for the Entire, com uh, entire country is uh, showing just how far China has recovered um, and how far it has normalised um, as opposed to other countries uh, since the initial shutdown that we had here uh, due to the COVID uh, in February earlier this year. So what I'm trying to describe here for you is that there is a different dynamic and if that access into that dynamic is what has become available. So in China, as I said earlier, China, the copper price serves as a proxy for the whole macro economy. And in many ways, uh, in years ago, um, in many ways uh, before the, the development of the Chinese financial market, um, copper was perhaps the only way you could have of expressing a negative view on the Chinese economy. Selling copper um, became a, a means of uh, being, being short the Chinese market in total. However, uh, there's no need to do that now, but, but copper remains deeply embedded within the uh, Chinese uh, financial structure, within the commodity structure. Now, there are 
other illustrations of this, this dynamic here. Recently, we saw WTI uh, in, as negative prices. Um, WTI was trading negative numbers. Uh, Brent was trading at 19. Crude oil on the INE here in China was trading at 31. So there was a huge physical arbitrage between the international market and the market here in China, which led to massive volumes being shipped into China uh, through that physical arbitrage of merchants being able to, to buy in, uh, in, in uh, the Middle East and shipped into, um, into China. In actual fact, the INE uh, tripled the volume of uh, warehouses or, or uh, storage points to enable this, um, this volume to come into, into China, this volume of oil to come into China. Now, one of the questions you should ask yourself is would this, um, would this have been available without the transparency of the two-year-old iron e crude, crude oil market? And I would think perhaps not. So the other uh, big uh, commodity here, which you no doubt heard of, is iron ore. And basically, China imports 65% of all the global uh, seaborne iron ore volume. It is massive in the market, and therefore, the prices inside China should really dictate, by and large, the prices globally. But until the, we had the overseas intermediary mechanism, I don't think that was really truly uh, transparent and available. So, as I conclude on this, uh, this first video, as we have seen, China has a strong rationale to open its commodity futures markets to international participants. So its domestic prices are adjacent to international norms. It has uh, a huge... Uh, liquid domestic commodity marketplace that is 50% of the global futures traded volume. And Chinese commodity prices in RMB will, in my opinion, become the benchmark in the region. So now you have a background on the Chinese commodity market. In the second video, we will move to how foreign in investors can participate in the Chinese futures markets. So, on to part two.